Well, hello and welcome to Talk Time. Uh, this week, we're going to take a look at transportation. Something to do with transportation. I mean, I'm sure that if you've, you've passed through Accra and perhaps other cities after five o'clock, you've seen the long queue of workers looking for transport to go back home. And sometimes the queue can, can, can stay for as long as up to about 8 p.m. and so on. I'm sure you also do remember that various measures have been introduced over the years to deal with this problem. Move workers to work early, send them back home early, avoid the traffic congestion and so on. That's exactly what we are discussing today. Welcome to Talk Time. African Center for Capacity Building, AFCA, organizes the following executive and advanced certificate programs like Executive Certificate in Project Management, Executive Certificate in Human Resource Management, Executive Certificate in Real Estate and Property Management, Executive Certificate in Data and Records Keeping, Executive Certificate in Monitoring and Evaluation, Executive Certificate in Logistics and Transport Management, Executive Certificate in CCTV Monitoring and Installation. AFCAP, where capacity building is our priority. For registration and inquiries, please call 0244-405047-0242-135533. We have our branches in Accra, Tamale, Kumasi, and Wa. Saturdays and weekday sessions are available. Admission is still in progress. Enroll now. Join the African professionals. AFCAP, where capacity building is our priority. Hello and welcome back to Talk Time. And as I indicated, we are going to be taking a look at the transport situation. What is it? How do we move people to work and back home early? How do we avoid traffic and so on? You do remember that in the previous administration, a bus service was introduced, which was simply called Ayalolo. What happened to Ayalolo and so on? And today, we are particularly privileged to have with us in the studio my own very good friend, very, very good friend, Fred Chidi, who spoke, or is still speaking, for the Ayalolo Bus Transit Company. So you're welcome to the Thank studio. Thank you very much, Senior. <laughs> Thank you. It's a privilege to be here. Yeah. Yes. Now. Where is Ayalolo today? You hardly see Ayalolo anywhere. What is happening? Um, it, it's an unfortunate situation and it, it saddens my heart as a spokesperson for the organization that was running Ayalolo to report to you that due to circumstances beyond the control of the company that was running it, we have to pack all the buses. Uh, in total, there was, uh, in our custody, 245 buses that were imported into the country in 2015 by the previous regime. Uh, we, in total, we had put, we had deployed 59 of those buses on two corridors in Accra, that is the Amasaman Tudu Corridor and then Kaswa Tudu Corridor. Uh, we had intended to deploy uh, quite a substantial number on the Adenta uh, Accra CBD corridor and then also move to Tema to Accra because obviously you know that there are four major arteries that all of them merge in, into the city center. So basically that is what we were doing until um, some issues started cropping up and we thought that we could manage them, but it got to a point where we could not. And so the directive was given to pack the buses, which we have. So if you ask what happened to the buses, uh, the buses were rolling, uh, very nice buses, brand new buses, they were rolling on the corridors that I mentioned. But as of no November last year, 
we packed all the buses. 25 of them have been taken to Kumasi because the Kumasi Metropolitan Assembly uh, wanted to try a pilot, uh, almost akin to what we were doing here in Accra. So besides the 25 that was taken to Kumasi, the rest are here in Achimota, in Accra. <laughs> I want to understand this properly. You mean the brand new buses have been packed? Yes. They are not doing anything? Yes, senior. Why? Well, they've been packed because uh, if you look at the Ayalolo bus system, the mechanics of it or the system that runs it is mechanical. Uh, there's a... Um, a computerized system in terms of the ticketing arrangement where you know traditionally when you get on a bus and you you're moving from one destination to the other what we are used to is to pay a conductor on board the bus or pay the trotters mates on board the bus but the system we were running was using a computerized system where people bought the tickets in advance and the, 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 the technology we're deploying was that um, when you get on board a bus, you use the, the paper ticket or the card ticket that we have. And then you swipe. If you have good credit on your card, it gives you access onto the bus. You go past a 10 star, you select a seat of your choice and you sit. When you get to your destination and you are getting off the bus, you swipe your card and then access is granted, you get out. The right amount is deducted depending on the distance traveled. So that is it. Now the initial trouble with that was many of our patrons didn't understand it because it's a new technology and it was a novel for people to get on board a bus and be swiping cards and 10 style opening and all. So it became, it was a bit cumbersome. Um, but. Uh, we tried through constant education, getting uh, people involved, getting people to know the system. We did a lot of education. And then um, I was so happy we could, at one time we were, we were moving about 11,000 passengers uh, across the corridors every day. Then what happened was the, we were not raising enough money to meet the cost of running the operations. And I will explain. But, but, but that's true for every business. Yes. <laughs> it, it doesn't justify parking the buses. Yes. That is true. But if, we, if you're running a business and uh, you're not meeting your operations costs, you're not meeting uh, administrative costs, you're not able to pay your workers regularly, it created a problem in the sense that the money that the tickets, ticket revenue was not enough to meet operational cost because the prices were pegged below the normal fares. Uh, for instance, uh, if you're traveling between Amasaman and Tudu and you go on a trotro, you were paying three CDs thereabouts. Ayalolo was charging two CDs 50 pesos because it was supposed to be a social good, a social intervention policy. And the model we were uh, ex executing suggested that, like everywhere else in the world, public transport is subsidized by the state. But unfortunately for us, uh, that was not the situation in our case. Besides, uh, the system was designed to run on dedicated infrastructure. Because if you look at the stretch between Amasaman and Tudu, uh, which is about 21 kilometers, the dedicated infrastructure on the corridor was just about half a kilometer. And so most of the time, the buses were stuck in traffic. And when that happens, people forgot about comfort. Riding in comfort was not an issue. It was not an option. People wanted to get to their destinations on time. And so they opted for uh, the normal trotter that we see on the street. So eventually, the patronage started dwindling. And we were counting on support from, from the states. But that was not forthcoming. 
We made se uh, several interventions to the powers that be, Ministry of Transport, Ministry of Local Government, uh, but nothing came forth. And so eventually we ground it to halt. But I remember that there were dedicated lanes for the buses. Was yes. that not meant to ensure yes. that, that they move faster than ordinary you know, commercial vehicles? Unfortunately, like I said, unfortunately the dedicated infrastructure is less than a mile. Because if you look, if you know the corridor very well, what is available is right in front of the Abeka, that intersection that goes to, on the Tessano stretch, uh, right in front of Peace FM, both sides. That is the only dedicated infrastructure. And then when you get to the center of town, um, there is something we call a contra flow. When you get to Farah Avenue, as you are climbing towards the UTC, uh, there is a dedicated infrastructure to the left so as to beat the traffic. But that is just um, just minimal. It's a drop in the ocean because the BRT as it is designed, it is meant to have a de its own, the bus, there must be dedicated bus lanes because the essence is to move a large number of people from one point A to point B within a certain time frame so that it will be so attractive that people who would otherwise would have driven their cars to the center of town would see it attractive enough. But it wasn't the case. So the design itself, the concept was good, but the, the infrastructure that was supposed to support it was non-existent. And then the first system was also unfavorable. And the, the third part was the support that was supposed to have come from central government did not come. And so we were virtually competing with the informal sector. And you know how our trotters behave. I mean, in the, in the heat of the moment, they will go around the shoulders of the road, go through some alleys, and they are there. And like I said, uh, for the commuter, the the objective is to get to my destination early, not to go and sit in a comfortable air-conditioned bus and be stuck in traffic for two, three hours. On the yeah, but all now. the problems you mentioned yeah. are problems which can be solved. Yes. So why ground the buses? Well, I mean, if for several months you make representations to the owners of the buses that we're not doing too well, and the system is so transparent because this is not like money coming into the pocket of somebody who is, uh, there's a deep pocket or there's a hole in the pocket and money is being siphoned. Mm -hmm. This is an electronic system where you can monitor because the system was so designed that you could know exactly where each bus is and what number of passengers is carrying at a particular time. So if anybody cared to know, the system was just so transparent that you could care, you would know the number of passengers that has been taken in one particular day. And the figures were open and everybody saw it, that the numbers were not good for the, to sustain the business. And so with the design, uh, you need support from central government to run the system. Now, we made several interventions to government, for example, in lifting fuel. We thought that fuel is one of the main budget items for the company. Uh, and we, we, we made a representation to the state that the other, a sister company that is also running, enjoys some level of subsidy in terms of fuel, taxes waived off fuel for that particular company. We thought that we could do the same, but that request was also turned down. So we, we went into the open market to buy fuel, just like you and I with our private vehicles, you go to the pump and fill. Uh, and so that is what happened. And we, I mean, we were eventually it has to run aground because all the conditions were not favorable. The road network, the infrastructure was not available. The buses were not moving fast enough. Ticket revenue was dwindling. Um, support from central government didn't come. Fuel, fuel that was supposed to have lifted, maybe with some of the taxes waived off, 
nothing like that was done. So it was it was just bound to happen. So close to two hundred and fifty buses. Two hundred and forty five in total. Twenty five. So close to two hundred and fifty. Yes, yes, yes. Have been wasted. Virtually wasted. Well, they're not running, so... <laughs> so wasted. Well, yeah. And if you leave buses over a period of time, mm. they become yes, unserviceable. Yes. How much is the cost of this, these buses? How much do you cost I have, us? I, well, from where I sit, it will be difficult for me to say because I don't know. You can't approximate. No, I, I have no idea. I don't know how much the buses cost. If a land cruiser is costing about 100000 mm dollars a bus like that should certainly be costing more than a hundred thousand dollars obviously that a bus should be like that should be costing more because it has the features of uh, any modern bus service there's air conditioning on board the buses the wi-fi service on board the buses you could charge your phone on the buses spacious seats very nice buses uh, but the truth of the matter, senior, is that I do not know the cost of the buses. I know, I know you don't. <laughs> but if we it's, if it's, if it's, if it's approximate and say that yeah. the bus will cost the same as a Land Cruiser, mm. for example, yeah. you're talking about something in excess of two... Hmm. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. That, that's fine. Right. Yeah. But but those figures something in excess of two million exactly. dollars. Yeah, exactly. So but those figures we can easily we can readily get yeah, but we're wasting at, at that. the Ministry of Transport. Because we're they were the ones we're that brought the buses in. We are certainly wasting that. Yeah. Mm. Late waste. Well, we was we are talking to my good friend, uh, Fred Chidi, who is the spokesperson of the Ayalulu bus transit company and we are talking about the collapse apparent collapse of the company and the wastage of state resources we're going to take a short break and uh, when we come back i like to ask what is the faith of those who are working for the company where are they? How many of, of, of them are there? And, 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 and so on. <laughs> this appears to be a very, very sad story. Short break. Today, we can trust sources of water anymore. Confidence is gone due to human activities. Same human activities introduces well mechanized machines which purifies water i bring to you ultimate natural mineral water deep from underground tasty well purified and corporately packaged ultimate natural mineral water let's drink the new for bulk call 020 379 1888 or 0244 515 801 ultimate natural mineral water my water, your water, our water. Well, hello and welcome back to Talk Time. And we're in conversation with Mr. Fred Chidi, spokesperson of the Ayalolo Transit Bus Company. And we're talking about the very sad story, exceedingly sad story of the collapse or eminent or apparent collapse of the company. Very sad story indeed. Now, sir, <laughs> Senior. what has happened to all the people who used to work for the company? Well, or who current, are working for the company? Well, First of all, has the company completely collapsed? Well, uh, as a matter of fact, I'll say no. Uh, it has not collapsed because, um, let me explain this. Uh, Greater Accra Passenger Transport Executive is a regulator of public transport in Greater Accra. Now, that entity was set up to regulate public transport across board from um, the informal sector to the formal sector. Now, the capacity of that institution is enhanced because the technocrats there are transport experts. 
And so when the BRT concept was introduced, the government then thought that they had the capacity. Personnel in that company had the capacity to manage it. So what they did was to get people in the informal sector, like the GPRTU, Protoa, Amalgamated, Cooperative. So they were the ones that the buses were handed over to. So GAPTE, or Greater Accra Passenger Transport Executive, was just a regulator. But because the personnel had the capacity to manage public transport, they were overseeing it. But the buses were being run by these transport unions, the cooperative, GPRT, and amalgamated. So the drivers and the conductors or any everybody that is associated with the bus company were from these unions. Now, we in GAPTE were just regulators or managers of the fleet because it was a government project. And GAPTE is a pseudo government uh, uh, institution. So, was, so with the current situation, the unions, the members, they've gone back to doing their own things. Since the instruction came that the buses are parked. So the buses are parked in the yard in Achimota. But GAPTE continues its regulatory function uh, of uh, managing public transport in, in, in the city. So it is not, you won't call it a collapse. Uh, probably we have stalled in, with, with, the, with the Ayalolo bus operations. Uh, we do not know what the government intends to do with Ayalolo. Uh -huh. But GAPTE that is a regulator of public transport in Accra, is still functioning and is doing its regulatory functions. For how long have you parked the buses? Since November last year. November, December, yeah, five months and counting, yeah. Yeah, but the experts say that if you pass a if you park a vehicle for five months, it deteriorates. Mm. Yes, absolutely it deteriorates. But you see there is an arrangement with the the providers, or no, I'll say the producers or the suppliers of the buses, that's Scania. Uh, with the terms that they agreed with the government at the time, there was a two year period where they would continue to maintain the buses. So there is a strict maintenance regime that has been adopted. So that once in, I think, two weeks, they come around, move the buses around just to ensure that there is fluid. The, this, you know, the, the parts are, are working. So as we speak right now, the, the buses are in fairly good condition, even though they've been parked. But every fortnight they are moved around, serviced, and and, and then reparked. So uh, we're just waiting. We, we're waiting. Uh, for us in GAPTE, uh, our position is that government, it will not take long for government to decide what to do. We have had so many options. Um, at the last time, the Minister for Transport uh, at the recent media the press announced that th th there are plans to move some of the buses to the regional capitals to serve the regions and so on. So it's, it's not uh, like a desperate situation where the buses are parked, where there's nothing uh, that they will be used for. The owners have plans for them. <laughs> I should say that the owners of the buses uh, have plans I, I, for I, them. I disagree. <laughs> it's a pretty desperate situation. Yeah, well. The 225 buses have been packed for five months. Yes. That's pretty desperate. Well, well in uh, the face of, mm -hmm. the, of the acute transportation problems in the urban areas. Uh, uh, it's it's so unfortunate. I live in Kaswa. And it takes me close to three hours to come to the city center during the peak period and the same number of hours to go back. And when I'm coming to town and I see the numbers of people that are looking in one direction, because when you're standing across to your right and people are looking to the left, everybody's looking to the left, waiting for the next available vehicle that has space in it. Hundreds of people from Kaswa all the way through Tetegu, Malam, Odoko, Kanishi, all the way to the city center. It breaks our heart that we have these buses sitting now. And you know what we did, Senior? Um, we attempted to have 
to deploy some of the buses at least to do peak service but it's just unfortunate that we have to be stopped because government has plans for the buses what are those plans uh, i am not able to say i wish we could be talking to the ministry of transport <laughs> so if you're not able to say how are you able then to come to the conclusion the government has plans for the buses well i just i just mentioned here that the, during the recent mid the press the minister for transport announced that government has plans for the buses and the details are on his desk but I, I i recall he mentioned that some of the buses will move will be moved to some regional capitals. He mentioned Tamale, Sekendi, Takrade, and so on. And so it takes, it takes five that. months to move a bus from Accra to Takrade. Well, the owners of the bus, uh, the buses have plans for them. Are they the owners of the bus? Who paid for the buses? It's, it's the GOG government of Ghana. And uh, it's it's under the auspices of the Ministry of Transport. They so by the extension, buses. the people of Ghana. The people of Ghana, yes. Paid yes. for those yes. buses. Yes. yes, yes, yes. And it's taking five months to move them to the regions. Yes. Now, based on your work, you know, you, you work with this company, you know, what would it take to resolve some of the transportation problems that workers face? Hmm. You know, especially in Accra, where the problem is most acute, what would it take? It is just commitment to, to fix the problem and regulation. And I will explain uh, by using the Nigerian example. Um, Lagos, Niger Lagos in Nigeria was notorious for its traffic. It still is. But sometime in the uh, early 2000s, the governor of Lagos State determined to fix the problem. And they had a similar situation. They brought in buses and they didn't have dedicated lanes. What they did was they decided that, first of all, they decided on which corridors to, uh, to use the buses. And they determined that that corridor has three lanes. And so what they would do is to dedicate one lane from point of origin to destination, dedicate one lane to the big bus operations, which would also include uh, ambulance, emergency vehicles or police vehicles. So then they decided to cordon off or, you know, take one lane, cordon it off by putting, by mounting barricades so that no vehicle would transcend into the other lane and ensured that it worked by rigidly enforcing it, by imposing fines onto people who abuse the system. And for us, that is the way to go. For instance, if we say Kaswa to Accra, or let's say Amasaman to Accra, most of the lane, most of the road itself has double or three lanes. So if we, we show proper commitment that we want to fix the congestion in Accra and by ferrying people in large numbers using big buses, all we needed to do is to decide that we were going to block one lane and we'll use that for those big bus operations. We have Ayalolo, we have Metro Mass, we have STC, we have VIP, we have ambulance service, we have police. So we say that one lane should be dedicated to those vehicles and ensure, enforce the rules that would, senior, there will be objections in, in the first place because people will say, oh, why are you giving preferential treatment to these vehicles? But you and I drive our private vehicles, you know how much fuel we consume in these vehicles and how long, I mean, how long we stay in traffic. So if these big buses are moving, let's say from Adenta to Accra, they are able to do it in 30 minutes. I will park my vehicle and then, you know, hop on a Yalolo bus or Metro bus or whatever. That will send us. That is what Nigeria did. That is what Rwanda did. South Africa did it. In the South African example, what they did was they actually banned the use of this private, the, the, the informal sector. What they did was to buy out the small vehicles 
and then form cooperatives and then introduce the big buses to them. Kenya is doing it with the Matatu. If you go to Nairobi, they have started using big bus operations. So it has to do with commitment. Now, when this suggestion was made, Senior, what we heard was that you know, we, we, we are getting close to the elections or you know, the, the, the people are objecting, they, they don't like it, the, the informal sector, you know, because they form a constituency of voters. Mm -hmm. See, so there's a political underpinning to all of this, but we are saying that if you have to do it and you are so considerate about what the voters will do, then do it within the election period, the the, the tenure of the the presidency or the the, the the government. I mean, we are second. This is the third year. We're just about entering the third year. So why don't you do it now? And once people begin to see the benefits then people will gradually buy into it. Mm. So, Sydney, I think that it has to do with commitment to fix the problem and then also making sure that the regulations are there and, and are being enforced. That, that's that's my thinking, sir. Now, the, the company, the Ayalolo Bus Transit Company, what is it doing? Just sitting there waiting for government? No, like I said... I thought it could also be advising government on what to do and so on. But what is the company doing? Well, I did say that the people, the the people who are running GAPTI, that is Greater Accra Passenger Transport Executive, are transport executives, people who have studied transport economy and know, uh, you know, the congestion, how to deal with the transport issues. And I, I speak for the group. And I, I know that we have made several representations to the powers that be. But as to why nobody is able to buy or take any of those suggestions is something that beats all of us. Have you received responses? Oh, we have, we have met with, with people. We've met with the transport ministry. We've met with even the senior minister. Uh, we, we, we have done a series of meetings. What have been the outcomes of these meetings? Well, the outcome is the buses are parked. Nothing is happening. Nothing. Absolutely nothing is happening. You know, and, and the unions who, who, which were running the buses, they've gone back to doing their informal business. The hundreds of, of drivers that were recruited for the for the process. The, most of them have gone by driving the truck trucks and the taxi. But there's a category of uh, drivers that I no longer see. That uh, in the street, who, there were some women drivers, yes. So I no longer see them anywhere. Yes, what happened to them but because the buses are not on the road, so uh, you know, but I thought they you know. said that they had gone back to doing what they, they were used to do. Yes, that's what I'm saying that they, they've gone back to doing their informal uh, service by running their trotters and their taxis. But I don't see those women in the trotters. No, no, those women, they were selected purposely to do a service for the Ayalolo. We, like I mentioned, we we wanted, we were even on the verge of introducing the Adenta service. So the, these um, dri the female drivers were trained for the purpose. And now that the buses are grounded, you know, they almost do almost. So they are unemployed. Yes, absolutely, they are unemployed. Yeah. Probably getting destitute. Um, maybe some of them may be doing other things. They may be doing some petty trading here and there. I I haven't seen any female truck truck driver in town yet. So I I suppose they are. But that's a huge statement about female empowerment. Yeah. That that was it because. You see, what we're trying to do was not just to develop a workable transport system, but we were making it all inclusive. Uh, because studies have shown, studies have been done, and show that women drivers tend to be more careful, tend to be, of, uh, are, are, you know, not exposed to accident cases. The statistics are there. And so that is why we decided to train, we trained 50 drivers. 50 female drivers and the it was supported by Scania the, the suppliers of the buses they, they, they helped in training the women but unfortunately since we are not able to deploy the buses but it is not to suggest that it won't be done we have presented a business case that we could do peak hours 
Because if the previous system was that the buses would be rolling at 10 minutes interval, and one of the criticism we had at the time was that the buses were running, especially during the off-peak period, they were running half empty or almost empty. Then we are making the business case that, look, we could still run these buses during peak period when people need them most. Because of all the four corridors that I mentioned, in the mornings, it is hell for people getting to town. So if we put 10 of those buses on any of the corridors, we are sure that they will be filled. You know, but the instruction is park the buses. Now, at the time we were parking the buses, what happened to those who had already bought carts? Yes. Uh, what happened was some of them, you see, because the, the thing was phased in gradually. Because we started with 59 buses, and then we started recalling the buses one after the other. And so it got to a time we didn't have the numbers. But I would admit that there are just a few, you know, still in the system with the bus, the, the bus cards. And once they have credit on those cards, what will happen is when we come back. <laughs> if you come back. Well, we are hopeful that we will come back. When we come back, then they would continue enjoying the service because they already have value on their cards. What if you don't come back? Can they redeem their, their monies? Well, I, I don't know how that will be possible, but the buses are there. The buses are not going anywhere. <laughs> if, we, if, if we take half of it to the countryside, we will still need buses here because, look, there's a need for public transport. There's a need for, for those buses in, 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 in Accra. We need them. We need big bus operations in Accra so that we can ease the congestion. The environment, we're polluting the environment with emission, you know, and these are environmentally friendly buses. So we need to deploy the bus. And we are appealing to the government. Please let Ayalolo come back. We need Ayalolo back. Well, viewers, we are in conversation with Mr. Fred Tidi, who speaks for the Ayalolo bus transit. And, uh, well, I feel very sad, I mean, today, about all these revelations. And perhaps all of us, wherever we are, can put in a word or two and, and put some pressure on the authorities to work towards making the situation better for everybody. We're going to go on a short break and when we come back I like to end with about two questions. So short break. and Well, hello, welcome back. And we are talking about transportation, urban transportation, transportation in Accra. We're talking specifically about the Ayalolo bus transit. And we are in this conversation with Mr. Fred Chidi. Now, Fred. Yes, sir. Yeah. Beyond just government saying that, look, put the buses back on the road. What would be needed for the buses to function efficiently? Uh, and, and for the pleasure of everybody. Oh, absolutely. Um, what, what I would um, say is that the ticketing arrangement, we need to take a second look at it. Uh, we do know that it is a system that is adopted elsewhere. If you go to the UK, uh, you hardly will see people buying tickets on board the bus. I, I mean, in terms of exchanging money. 
uh, people buy cards and you can plan. Uh, what we think should happen is we should roll side by side with the money system cash because uh, public transport basically is for the middle to the lower class and that is where the challenge is because people are in a hurry to get to wherever they're going they may not have the time to go through that laborious system of swiping a card and waiting for validation and that kind of thing so what we suggested we were going to do or what we wanted to do was to run a paper ticket alongside the card system so that eventually gradually we will get people to understand how the card system works because it's 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 a computerized system sometimes and, and it depends on gps sometimes the, the network is down people get, are getting on board the bus now they cannot have access to the bus because the turnstile is locked because the system cannot read to the data center which is in Achimota. So we said, well, the bottom line is for the business to be sustainable. So we're going to deploy paper tickets for people. When you are getting on board the bus, you buy a paper ticket like the Metro Mass does. Mm -hmm. And so they'll make money, you know, and then make sure that we plug the hole so that there won't be leakage. That, to me, will be a starting point. Then the commitment to have dedicated infrastructure for the buses so that they can move in quickly and carry as many people as possible. That way, like I said, people will be discouraged from using their small vehicles and hop on the big buses. And then we can eventually ease the, the congestion in Accra. We believe strongly, those of us in Capti, we believe that the Yalolo bus service is a sustainable business. But all of it depends on the powers that be to uh, provide the infrastructure. Because if you're talking about road infrastructure, you're talking about roads and highways, you're talking about Department of Urban Roads, you're talking about the police helping in enforcement. So it is multifaceted. It's, it involves other state institutions. Mm -hmm. And so all that we're calling for is the commitment to fix the problem of public transport in Accra. Because once we do it right, it, it eases, it, it makes life easy for everybody. Because if I spend six hours in traffic every day, it affects productivity. You know. Have you had any feedback from the 25 buses which were taken to Kumasi? How are they doing? <sighs> it, it's another sorry state. It's another sorry state of affairs. Now, we were told to release 25 buses to, to the Kumasi Metropolitan Assembly because they were going to start a pilot. I think they started something from a Jusu to the city center of Kumasi for, I stand to be correct, for about two or three weeks. Uh, they were faced with the same situation <laughs> because there were no dedicated infrastructure for the buses. So the buses were stuck in traffic and people, it was not attractive to people. So the same situation as in Accra. And so the buses were parked. Just recently, there was a, a news story where somebody took pictures of where the buses are parked and weeds were growing in between the vehicles that were parked. And it was, it was so, it's so heartbreaking. As we speak right now, the buses are still parked in the STC yard in Kumasi. We are told that it is a very fortified area with security, lighting and everything. But it's sad to say that brand new buses that were moved from Accra to Kumasi are still parked. They are not being used. So there is nothing happening in Kumasi as well. well thank you very much thank for, you, for, thank for, you, for coming to the <laughs> studio. You. Well, we've been, we've been talking to Mr. Fred Chidi who is spokesperson for the, the, the Aya Lolo Bus Transit Company. And we've had all the problems. Uh, 245 buses are packed. They are obviously wasting away. And uh, nobody can tell what the future is. That's the state of affairs. Well, as I always say, Pan-African Television tries to bring you the best in everything, like this excellent interview. Uh, so please stay with us throughout the week. 
We bring you the best in news, best in current affairs, best in sports, best in documentaries, best in everything. And uh, please stay with us until we meet again. Until then, it's goodbye from the director of the show, the cameraman, everybody. Goodbye until we meet again. Bye-bye.